refresh the screen. And would you like to go ahead, Laura, since we're live? All right, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. Here we go. Well, welcome everybody to the Tallgrass Prairie Center Restoration and Management Seminar Series, our first of the year. It's my pleasure to introduce Chris Helzer, who's Director of Science for the Nature Conservancy in Nebraska, where he's worked since 1997. Chris conducts research and evaluates prairie management and restoration work there. He's also dedicated to raising awareness about the value of prairies through his photography, writing, and presentations. Chris is the author of the Prairie Ecologist blog and two books, The Ecology and Management of Prairies in the Central United States and Hidden Prairie, Photographing Life in One Square Meter. Before we get started with Chris's presentation, I want to tell you about uh, something coming up next month. And that is, um, Doug Tallamy's uh, presentation. Sorry about that. Uh, on February 9th, uh, Doug Tallamy will be talking about his book and ideas and nature's best hope. So we hope you can join us for that uh, Thursday, February 9th at 4 p.m., same, same time. So we're looking very much looking forward to that. Um, with that, I will go ahead and uh, thank you, Chris, for being the lead speaker for our Tallgrass Prairie Seminar Series, and welcome. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, it's good to be here. Um, uh, the presentation I'm doing today will be new. Uh, this will be the first time I've done it, so I'm hoping it goes well. I'm sure it will. Um, and I'll try to leave plenty of time at the end to uh, talk about things or answer questions or whatever. So uh, let's see. There we go. So I think most people, when they think about the prairie in winter, uh, probably envision something like this, right? A bunch of brown grass, dried up plants. Uh, why would you go out in the prairie in the winter? There's nothing to look at. Um, and it doesn't change from day to day. So if, if you do go out, you don't have to go out again, right? Um, even from the air uh, or when we get snow, it's just, it kind of looks all the same. It's very drab and mono, monoculture. Uh, and of course, that's not true. There's lots to see in the prairie during the winter. Um, and the places that are beautiful during the summer are also beautiful during the winter. And if you get close, which is what I do most of the time, there's a lot of things to discover in the prairie, whether you're a photographer or not. Um, and there's color, if you know where to look for it. And the color I think is even more special because there's like, it, it stands out more in the winter, either against snow or against brown. Um, this is a photo that I took just this week in one of the prairies here in town. Uh, it's a sensitive briar with some seeds in it with fungus working on the seeds, trying to break down the seeds over the winter. So the other thing is a lot of the things that apply to prairies during the summer, again, apply during the winter. So there's a lot of texture in, in prairies in the winter, light matters uh, and, and changes just the same way. So this is a photo just as the sun was starting to come up above the horizon. Again, just, this is just a few weeks ago up at our Niobrara Valley Preserve in Nebraska. And then, you know, here's the same scene or roughly the same scene just a minute or so later and the, the difference between the, the cool blue light here and the warmer light here is a matter of just a little bit of time. But that light is still what makes photography work. And so you can use light in the winter. And actually, one of the nice things about winter photography is that during the summertime, when the sun is really high and there's no clouds, that light is super intense and it's really hard to work with as a photographer. And in the winter, the sun never gets up as high. And so there's a lot more of the day and sometimes the entire day where that bright sunshine is more usable as a photographer, which is kind of nice. 
but there's also some fun things you can do with moody light, I guess, um, you know, dark overcast days or foggy days. And fog is especially nice if it's cold because you get frost that comes with the fog. And you can do a lot of fun things with that or just either, again, as a photographer or just as someone who's going out to enjoy the day. Um, and if you're really adventurous, you can go out when it's snowing heavily and uh, enjoy that sensation too, whether you want to catch snowflakes on your tongue or just enjoy a hike when it's snowing. Um, so here's a photo. This is actually, you'll see some, some repeats of certain sites today. Um, this is a photo from my family prairie. Uh, which is a quarter section of land just south of Aurora, Nebraska, where I live. And then uh, I, I do a little bit of photography with a drone, getting some aerial photos, and it's especially nice for rivers, uh, I think, in the wintertime when they're iced over. There's just interesting patterns. So in addition to the sandbars that are common on the rivers that I visit a lot, like the Niobrara River here, um, and here, then you can mix in ice and frost and sometimes chunks of ice flowing down the water, that kind of thing. And then here's the Central Platte River, um, close to the Platte River prairies, where I've spent most of my career, both as a land manager and a scientist. But um, again, most of the what I do is focused closer to the ground. Um, when I go out walking in the prairie and I'm with other people, a lot of times the other people I'm with are looking up at birds or something like that. I'm usually looking down. I'm looking for insects and flowers. And so a lot of my photography reflects that too. And so during the winter time, if there's not snow, I'll usually gravitate toward water and look for ice and, and play around with different patterns. This is on the Platte River where there was a, some cool little stalactites or stalagmites uh, that popped up. And then I got closer and just played with textures. And water is nice if it's flowing because you can usually, if you can look at that interface between flowing water and, and ice, there's a lot of there's a lot going on, I guess, um, and a lot of different interesting shapes and textures, and so I play with those quite a bit too. And by the way, I'm going to go through a lot of these photos pretty quickly because one of the points I'm trying to make today is that there is a lot to see, and I figured I'd try to illustrate that by showing a lot of photos. So, this is a waterfall up on the Niobrara River, or that feeds the Niobrara River called Stair Step Falls. If you've ever floated down the Niobrara River um, in the National Scenic River portion. You've probably seen this. This is on Nature Conservancy land. But when I see a site like this during the winter, I usually try to get closer because, again, I like getting up and, and looking at that interface between the water and the ice and photographing uh, sort of the motion and uh, those, those ice patterns that change quite a bit. And this is down on the plat, taking advantage of the fact that usually in the mornings, Again, along that interface between water and ice, there's a lot of frost that develops. And then if you are really lucky, you can find the ways that frost and reflections both play into photos. Um, so this is me laying on thin ice on my belly with a camera, uh, dangling over the open water, hoping that it doesn't break, but knowing that if it does, I'm in six inches of water. So you don't have to worry about my safety, just my sanity. So here's a, a close-up of some of that frost that, that's on the surface of ice a lot of times. And one of the things that I found in the last several years that I, once I found it, I couldn't not see it when I go out, is I start to see things that look like little evergreens or Christmas trees um, on the ice where you have little, little pieces of vegetation sticking up and then the frost develops along the bottoms of them and it's thicker toward the bottom and thinner toward the top. So it does kind of shape itself like a conifer a lot of times. So I've started really watching for those um, and, and trying to photograph them as, as Christmas trees or sometimes as forests of Christmas trees. And for scale, these are like this, this one here is maybe inch and a half tall at the most. So they're really small, uh, but they're worth taking the time to admire, I think. And then a lot of the photos from today are going to be at a wetland um, it's a restored wetland along the Platte River. It's a, there's a, a creek that runs through our property, our Platte River Prairies property with, for the Nature Conservancy, and it's a restoration of a sand pit where we did a bunch of work to turn a sand pit lake back into a shallow wetland with some side channels and things where a stream flows through it. 
it's just a really kind of a magical little place. And I spent a lot of time there doing restoration work. And so then that makes me appreciate it even more. But it really is just a kind of a neat place that it does freeze over, but it also has enough groundwater interface that there's usually some open water in some places. Um, so here's an example of a really cold day where the last of that open water did freeze, but this was a hole used either by otters or beaver, uh, or probably both, um, to get in and out of the ice, but it had frozen over on this particular day. And one of the things that I'm going to, I'll feed back into this later, but the bubbles underneath the ice, they get trapped by the ice as the ice develops and thickens. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do in the winter is to photograph ice bubbles. And this is one of the best places that I've found to do it. So we'll see, we'll talk more about ice bubbles later, but I wanted to preview it here. But at that wetland, one of the other things that's fun and is to try to figure out what causes some of the ice patterns that I see. So for example, here, I don't know for sure that I can explain what's happening. There are little mounds of ice around the base of these plants. Now, that could be snow that, that developed and then melted and refroze and turned into a more clear ice. Um, I don't know if I can come up with another explanation. I think that's my best hypothesis at this point, but you see that a lot on wetlands uh, or on just ice patterns where you have plants. Here's another example here, but sometimes you see the reverse too, where vegetation that's interfacing with the ice warms up and seems to create a little bit of a depression around it where it kind of melts some of the ice and creates a little bowl. And then you also see sometimes where you get the mounds develop along the stems and then the water level goes down and the ice drops, but it leaves some of the mounds suspended above, which I think is what's happening here. Um, and then sometimes you get that plus the warming stems creating a bowl and you get sort of the mound and the bowl at the same time. I'm making up these terms, by the way, they're not technical terms. The other thing that's fun with ice is trying to find things that are Im embedded with them. So uh, this was actually just from last week. There's a little creek that runs through, through Aurora where I live. Um, here's another one from that creek last year, a uh, little silver maple leaf, maple leaf. And then this is out at our, our family prairie. Um, where there's an entire wetland plant just sort of encased in ice, like a like the beginning of a fossil, except in frozen form. And more, just more things embedded in ice. Okay, now let's talk about ice bubbles. I could do an entire 45 minute talk on ice bubbles. I won't, um, but I'm gonna show you quite a few because I just think they're fascinating. I think they're fascinating both because they're beautiful, but also just, again, trying to figure out how they were formed and you think about the source of the ice bubbles, you know, a lot of times it's probably methane or, or gases that are escaping from, you know, plants that are decomposing it underneath. Um, and then as they get to the surface, they hit that, that frozen surface and then they stop and then the ice moves down and freezes through them. And then another bubble comes up underneath them and is suspended and then freezes and then another one comes up underneath. So you can get these stacked bubbles sometimes. So in this photo, it's hard to tell because it's it's a photo, but that top bubble is the surface of the ice and everything else is below the ice's surface. But I just, I mean, I could play around with ice bubbles forever. I'm just gonna show you a bunch of photos of them because I think they're fun. Um, and these are especially good, it seems like in shallow water or along the edges uh, where there's a lot of freezing and thawing that goes on. And I don't know that I can explain why the water in, or the ice in one particular place is sometimes dark and sometimes light or sometimes cloudy or sometimes not. I'll go back to this one. This one, I think it looks like an abstract painting. Um, I think it would look good on a, a wall size mural, maybe if you were trying to create a relaxing wall hanging of some kind. More ice bubbles. This one I took the other day uh, and it's clearly a cartoon elephant created in the ice, which is fun. And then I don't know how to explain things like this because I see these patterns too. And I really like them, but I don't know why they happen. This one is another kind of more extreme example where it almost looks like the ice is wrinkled up. Um, I Yeah, I maybe when we go into questions, if somebody can explain the physics of these to me, that'd be really fun. Uh, here's another example of one that I can't explain, but I enjoy. Here's a black hole uh, in the ice. <laughs> For scale, it's about half an inch probably across that hole. And then 
sometimes you see bubbles coming off of plant stems that are embedded in the ice where it looks like the bubbles are just radiating out in all directions from those plant stems and then they get frozen at different times and so you get stacks of bubbles radiating not just vertically but also sideways and again I don't know that I can fully explain why that's happening but it sure is beautiful and it's not just plants so sometimes you see those same radiating lines of bubbles coming out of insects that get trapped in the ice like this little damselfly nymph and then again when you're hanging out on ice you see other things that get frozen and embedded a lot of insects um and I've done some experiments with some of these to see if they were alive or dead. Everyone so far, if I when I thaw it out, it seems to be dead. But I keep hoping maybe I'll find one that is encased in ice, but in a way that it can come back to life in the spring. This is clearly not an insect. Um, but one of the things that's fun, if you go out in the right places in the wintertime, frogs are supposed to be pretty much dormant. Uh, and my understanding is they a lot of them survive most of the winter by sort of sitting at the bottom of a stream bed and they do a lot of their oxygen exchange through the sides of their body. So they're doing they're getting oxygen through their skin. In fact, they try to keep sediment, they try to pick a place where sediment's not moving because they have to have the sediment not sort of stack up next to them because then that blocks that air exchange. But I've been out and I've seen these frogs right underneath the ice. And then I've seen them moving around, which was pretty surprising because, you know, you think of frogs as ectothermic or cold blooded, they shouldn't be able to move around when it's cold. And if it, you know, if they're right underneath the ice, that's pretty cold. And then one day I even saw some that I saw a few under the ice. And then there was a spot where something had stepped through the ice and created a hole. And some of the leopard frogs had come up on top of the ice. And, you know, it was 28 degrees or something that day. So it wasn't like it was a balmy uh, temperature outside. But some of these leopard frogs were just sitting out on the ice staring at me. Um, and I thought for a while some of them looked dead because they had their eyes closed. But then when I got close, they opened up their eyes and stared at me. So um, there are some surprising animals that you can find in the wintertime. And some of that is at the beginning of the winter when you're still in that transition phase. So like this little hoverfly got surprised by an early October snow. Um, but probably survived well enough, even though after that snow, I'm not sure there was enough for it to eat because it's a, a pollen feeder. But this juvenile wolf spider was photographed on a day that was, I think, 18 degrees out, and it's walking across a frosty, frozen surface of a creek. Um, and this was the first photo I took of an insect or an invertebrate, I guess, in the wintertime. And this is probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, maybe. And since then, I've really started paying attention because there's a lot more than you might expect. In fact, there's entire websites, if you go looking, that will talk about the kinds of invertebrates that you can see that are active out during the winter. So here's a little ant running around on the snow, too. So again, these things that are supposed to be ectothermic, uh, cold-blooded, um, don't always follow the patterns we expect. And then a lot of insects and invertebrates, of course, spend the winter not active. Um, here's a, a Chinese praying mantis egg case. So a lot of things like this are, you know, they just sort of become eggs or or go underground, protect themselves somehow and just wait it out until the spring. And then in, verte in terms of vertebrates, there are going to be some animals like opossums that are st going to stay active all winter. Of course, birds, there's a lot of birds that are active, some of which just hang out from the summer into the winter. But a lot of them that we see here are either, um, well, most of them have moved south from somewhere that's even colder than here, and they think this is a good place to spend the winter, um, even though a lot of their peers have gone further south. And then some, like the juncos, uh, just have a very different range during the winter than they do during the breeding season. There's a red-bellied woodpecker on a, on a snowy day. But just like always, and maybe even more extreme in the winter, a lot of the animals that are around, you don't see directly, so you have to look for the signs, and you look for the tracks to see where they've gone. And the nice thing about a snowy day, of course, is that not only can you see the tracks, but you can spend time following them and try to see what they're up to. And you can, I was going to say you could waste a day pretty easily doing that. It's, it's not a wasted day, but you can spend a day pretty easily just kind of following tracks around to see what they're doing, why they're going different places and see if you can figure out where the, the end of the track is. Um, here's a sharp-tailed grouse up in the sandhills that for some reason 
decided to go one way and then walk through a couple of sumac stems and turn around and decided to go the other way. I don't know why. It's a little mouse tracks. And in terms of watching what the tracks are doing, this is uh, something I've discovered, and it's not like a new discovery, but was, discovery for me was the value of Western ragweed to birds during the winter. So these are some Western ragweed plants. And what I found is if you want to find bird tracks in the snow, you just find the closest patch of Western ragweed and that's where the tracks will be because they spend a lot of time feeding on the seeds of those ragweed plants. So we cuss out ragweed uh, for hay fever and because it doesn't have a pretty flower, but boy, those seeds are sure valuable apparently or attractive to birds during the winter time. I think I can explain this. Um, it's, I mean, obviously it's a bird, right? I, I think that what happened was this is a bird that either flew and landed briefly and then took off again or swooped down very low. But I think what looks like or where it looks like the head should be on the left, you see two little indentations. I think those are tracks where the feet hit either as it was taking off or that's where it was standing when it took off. And then the wings just hit the snow and then maybe the tail hit the snow as it left. But it was really beautiful. And I've seen this a couple of times, but this is the first one that I got a decent photo of. And then again, in terms of where the tracks go, a lot of times if you follow small mammal tracks, they don't go too far before you find the hole that they came out of. Um, and then you can sort of see the tracks radiating out from that, from that single hole. Here's another example uh, back at my family prairie again. And if you follow them long enough, sometimes you'll find the food that they're eating or gathering. So here's a little cache of uh, Canada wild rice seeds that I'm assuming a mouse gathered and you know climbed up and grabbed the seeds and brought them down either to eat later or you know started eating and got interrupted or some combination of the two maybe okay and bison are not small uh, but i still think they count as winter treasures and i'm just going to show a bunch of bison photos pretty quickly here because bison in the snow uh i think become even more stoic looking than they normally do uh they don't look like they're bothered by the cold they seem to be able to find plenty of plenty of food to eat, even when it looks like there shouldn't be anything really good to eat. Um, and they're just so gosh darn fuzzy. They've got that full winter coat. Um, and I don't know, stoic is just the best word I can come up with for them during the winter time, especially. They don't move around a lot. They stand pretty still, which makes photography really easy. And I debated whether to talk about river otters. Um, if if anybody here reads my blog or follows my blog at all, you might know that river otters have been the bane of my existence in a lot of ways. Um, I I have worked for 25 years, more than 25 years, along a stretch of the Platte River that has the highest concentration of river otters in the whole state of Nebraska. I've never seen a river otter along the Platte River, but I see their signs all the time, and lots of other people around me see them uh, and like to tell me about seeing them. And I've written and talked a lot about how frustrating that has been in the past. And I've just recently decided I don't care anymore, which is why I didn't almost didn't talk about it here. But I uh, I don't know. People would have gotten mad if I hadn't talked about it. So I'm talking about it. I did see a river otter in Nebraska up on the Niobrara River, but unfortunately I didn't get a photo of it. I got a photo of the hole that it had been in just right before uh, I got my camera out and then it went under the ice. And people don't seem to think that that counts for anything. Uh, but I'm showing it to you because I think it counts. But I'm now I'm going to retreat back to my wheelhouse. So this is my comfort zone, <clears throat> which is flowers, insects, or things of that size. So here's some rosinweed seed heads uh, that I photographed last week. Here's another rosinweed seed head from, from earlier, a couple of years ago. And there's a lot of seed heads that I could show you. I tried to narrow it down to a reasonable number. Um, which I'll go through fairly quickly, but plants in the Asteraceae family are fun because they still have things that look sort of like petals and they still resemble flowers, but kind of winter flowers. Sometimes they still have the seeds attached too, which is nice. Here's some goldenrod with frost. And then it's fun to look at, uh, and those of you who harvest seeds do this anyway, but just the different packages that seeds come in and wildflowers are really fascinating to me. So Monarda or bee balm or bergamot is a nice example where they have these vertical tubes that kind of cluster together and the seeds are inside those little tubes. 
but those tubes also make really fun photo subjects um, from lots of different angles. And so in the winter, a lot of my photography and, and just observations focus on texture and patterns much more than color because the color is less variable during the winter time. But here's some shell leaf penstemon, other seed heads, there's lead plant, partridge pea, Illinois bundle flower, which is a fun one because it holds its seeds nicely, uh, both for a long time and visibly, which is kind of neat. And then this is that sensitive briar I showed it at the very beginning, but uh, I found some with frost on the, on the pods one morning, so I played with those for a while. Here's some tall thistle seeds, one of our native thistles, stiff goldenrod. Dotted gay feather is, a, is one that I am attracted to a lot because it's usually got frost or snow on it. Um, and it's one of the one of the plants that holds onto those fuzzy seeds well into the winter a lot of the times, or at least some of the plants do. And then uh, dogbane, I showed this photo earlier, but here's another photo of the same kind of seed right next to it. But dogbane and milkweed to some extent uh, will hold on to seeds, and or you can still find the seeds into the winter, but milkweed seems to disappear pretty quickly, um, faster than dogbane anyway. And then you can't do prairies without grasses. So um, especially with frost and snow, grasses are nice because like Indian grass, for example, here has a lot of uh, hairs on the on the seed and all the uh, on the appendages around the seed. And then uh, that only that not only gives them texture, but it also helps them hold on to snow and frost a little better, um, which you know highlights those seeds really nicely. But then there's also things like Canada wild rye that have a lot of place for frost and snow to accumulate too. This was just at the end of uh, 2022, nice frosty morning uh, up at the Niobrara Valley Preserve, and there was a whole lot of blue grama around. So I spent time photographing that from different distances and at different angles and things. It holds on to frost nicely too, right? And then I have several obsessions in my life, but one of them is definitely ice bubbles, and another one is Cytos grandma. Um, Cytos grandma I can do any time, like any time of year. So I'm just going to show you the, my winter Cytos grandma selections. And again, this is a subset, a uh, small subset of my Cytos grandma photos because I just am so fascinated by them. If you can back, if you can put them again up against a plain background, they're really pretty. Um, the challenge with Cytos a lot of times is in a focus. For, to focus on them and not get a lot of background noise, you have to use a shallow depth of field, which means you have to get the camera oriented just right so that all the seeds are the same distance from the camera. And sometimes that takes some playing around, but I really like the results of it. Again, I could do 45 minutes on Cytos Grandma too, but I won't. But I'm going to do another minute or so before we're done. <clears throat> all right, maybe not a minute. Um, Here's a cattail seed. One of the things with cattails, and this is becoming better known, and, and maybe everybody here knows it, but for the most part, in the part of the world where we're talking about here, cattails that you see are, are invasive. Um, we've lost almost all of the native broadleaf cattails, at least in Nebraska, and what we're left with is either narrow leaf cattails or hybrid cattails between narrow leaf and broadleaf, and in both cases, they're invasive and pretty problematic, and we're, we're really struggling to figure out how to deal with them. The only thing I think that's good about them, what's well, not the only thing, but one of the nice things about them is their seeds are really pretty to photograph. And especially when they land on the ice, to me, they look like dainty little birds, maybe cranes, uh, but they have that kind of shape to them. And then sometimes you'll find them resting on the ice in a way where the seeds are sort of poking up like this. Uh, if you get down on their level and photograph them, they're a lot of fun. And then here's some more frost. and leaves of both grasses and wildflowers are fine but they're not normally photo subjects but when they get frost on them they become i think more interesting photo subjects or just again things to look at when you're walking around and sometimes if the frost is big enough it could become the focal point rather than the plant the plant's just sort of a carrier uh so that you can see those frost crystals and look at think about how they accumulated overnight and how they how they grew and you know, that's one night's worth of accumulation on a goldenrod plant. That's pretty cool to think about. And I think maybe a half a dozen times in my life, I've hit this just right where you get an, an ice storm. And then 
you get a sunny day after the ice storm, before the wind breaks up the ice, and before the temperatures warm up enough to melt the ice. That's part of the equation that has to work out. The other thing it has to work out is you have to be able to get to wherever the photos are that you want to take. And so these are some ice photos that I've taken over a couple different ice storms, mostly here in town, because that's where I can get after a serious ice storm, because I can walk there with my camera. And there's a little, a couple little prairies uh, on the edge of Aurora, all part of one, one big piece called Lincoln Creek Prairie. And so when I need to go to the prairie and I don't have time to go very far, that's where I go. And so with an ice storm, I can slide my way carefully down over there and uh, photograph all kinds of things encased in that ice. But most ice storms, by the time the light comes out and I can get photos that are worth taking, um, the ice is gone. It just It's either melted or has been broken off by wind or whatever. But when it all works out and I can get there, it's definitely worth my time. And it's, re it's actually really hard because it's like, like where do you stop? Um, everything is pretty, everything is encased in ice. Everything looks like a little jewel of some kind. And so choosing photo subjects is really challenging because everything could be a photo subject and you've got a limited amount of time before the ice melts. So I run around with like a chicken with my head cut off a lot of times. And then snow. Um, we just got six inches yesterday. I was out this morning photographing snow because that's another one that, especially lately, you better take advantage of it while it's there because it doesn't usually last very long anymore. And one of the things with snow is that it forms such a nice background. You can you can create these sort of very simple artistic uh, images of kind of just lines, simple lines against a plain background. So I do a lot of that, especially when the light's not great. You can still sort of deal with shapes and textures rather than trying to do anything with, uh, you know, warm light or something like that. Here's some smooth sumac and some grass. Okay, I wanted to talk about this one. This is one of my favorite photos from the winter, I think. Um, it's very simple. I think it's mare's tail. I'm not 100% sure that it's mare's tail, but I think it's mare's tail. Um, I should have paid more attention when I was there, but I wasn't botanizing at the time. I was photographing. But these leaves were dangling off of a long stem, and I was able to get down and isolate them with a with you know a, a clean background. And you can see the melting snow in the foreground, and just I I don't know. It's just one of those photos that it wasn't what I was thinking about or going out for that day. And I'm just really glad my brain noticed it and uh, that I stopped and took the picture. Oh, this is a fun thing. I, this is another presentation I could do, which is just uh, grass circles. Uh, so when you get the wind that blows leaves of a grass around, it's tied in the middle. So you, you get this sort of radiating patterns on the snow created by, by grasses that blow around. And a lot of the grasses, when the leaves are wrinkly, then they intercept the snow at multiple points and you get multiple lines in a circle. Uh, so yeah, those are a lot of fun too. This is back to the uh, sort of that transition period. So this was, there's some photos here from my, my little prairie garden in my yard where because of mo both moisture and, uh, you know, being clipped and regrowing, there were some plants that were still, you know, going strong and either flowering or, or had seeds in them. This is, this is a prairie violet when the first snow of the year came. So I was able to photograph that. And then on the other end of that spectrum, Late snows in April are neat because you get to, you know, see flowers um, that are starting to bloom and then get covered with snow. I don't have any pasc flowers in this. I should have put some pasc flowers in there, but of course that's one that happens a lot. Okay, uh, snow windows. I'd love walking out in the snow, especially after the snow has been there for a while. And you find these little openings in the snow and it's, again, one of those things like the ice patterns, trying to figure out why they're there. Um, sometimes it's it's because there's a plant poking through them or there's a plant underneath the surface that probably catches enough light to warm up a little bit and then it melts the snow around the edges of it and kind of creates this little little framing of that, of that plant. Um, and other times I'm not sure exactly why those windows are there, but they're really fun. And then as that snow continues to melt, the windows get bigger, but the edges get more and more interesting because they start to form these really neat little ice patterns. 
And sometimes they're just fun little ice patterns. And sometimes you look at them, you try to make them into something. So they're kind of like a Rorschach test, right? So there's a little camel here, clearly on the right side. Um, maybe a puppy dog, I don't know. You can come up with your own ideas on some of these. Um, but to me, there's an animal on the left side here with its eye and several legs. I don't know, just fun to look at the patterns. And because there's a shadowed area behind it, just photographically what ends up happening is the light is bright enough that the ice or the melting snow is is white but the background just becomes black because the camera can't handle that entire range of really bright white to, to dark and so um the background goes dark not because i'm using any kind of special technique it's just because that's the best the camera can do and then this is an example of something that it was melting snow and then it froze again overnight and created a little bit of frost on the edge of the melting snow and you just sort of get layers on layers of beauty then i'm going to end with a little color um because like I said at the beginning, one of the great things about the winter is there's less color, there's less variation of color, but that means when you find color, it's even that more exciting because it really stands out strongly against whatever background you find. So these are some smooth sumac leaves that uh, retain their color. This was just a couple weeks ago um, with some frost to, to accent them a little bit. And then another of my many obsessions is rose hips in the winter because they are so vibrantly red. Uh, and especially against a background of either snow or frost, uh, they really stand out and, and they're like finding little Easter eggs out there, except that they're much easier to find than Easter eggs, I guess. You can see right into the depths of the soul of this one. And a lot of times they're hiding in little windows too, for the same reasons we were just talking about, where they melt the, uh, melt the snow around them just enough that they kind of show up and frame themselves really nicely. All right, that's what I've got. Um, we got plenty of time to talk and answer questions or uh, talk about whatever you want to talk about. Oh, and this is, if, if you haven't read my blog and you're interested in it, prairieecologist.com um, is where you can find it. And then if you want to know more about the Nature Conservancy, nature.org. Um, and then if you put slash Nebraska, you'll see what our Nebraska work is, is like. So thanks very much. Chris, we have a question already. Good. This is Laura. Uh, what kind of camera do you find works best? Yeah. Um, I use a, I think it's about a 10 year old Nikon model. It's a Nikon D7100. It's not a fancy camera. Um, it's fancy in that you can put other kinds of lenses on it. That's about it. It's a it's a digital camera. Uh, you can buy one used for about four hundred dollars, which is not nothing, but it's not you know sell your house to buy a camera camera, which which exists too. Um, so with at least with the work that I do, because I don't need uh, fast autofocus tracking or anything to chase birds around, I can get by with pretty cheap cameras, and then I buy I spend money on lenses. But even there, you know. A lot of money for a lens might be several hundred dollars. The macro lens that I use on a lot of these photos um, is a is an older version of a of a 105 millimeter Nikon macro lens that you can buy used for about 250 dollars now. So it's it's more about light and patience um, than it is about equipment. But the equipment is important. I mean, like having a macro lens that allows you to focus closely enough to to get you know some of these really small things that I like chasing around. That is important. But um, yeah, you don't have to buy the the newest, most expensive stuff to to get good photos either. We have another question. Uh, where were you when you photographed the buffalo? Oh, thank you. I should have said that. Um, that's at the Niobrara Valley Preserve, so the Nature Conservancy land in Nebraska. We have fifty six thousand acres right up along the Niobrara River. There's about twenty five miles of river frontage there. Um, and we have actually two herds of bison up there. Um, each of them is on like 10 to 12,000 acre pastures. So they've got a lot of space to move around. We're trying, by the way, to figure out a way to make those more accessible to the public, but there's obviously some issues with bison and people. Um, and when they're all in one great big 12,000 acre pasture, it's it's hard to 
figure out how to get them to be close to the road or be where people can see them. But we're working on it. And as soon as we figure out, I'll let everybody know so you can go, come see them because it's worth it. George McMillan asks, do you use filters when you take pictures with the sun showing on sunny days? Um, I do not. I know other people do. Um, I just don't. I, I, I typically... Um, the biggest issue I run into is making sure my lenses are clean because otherwise I get all kinds of lens flare. I still get lens flare, but I get I get less less issues with distortions and things if I keep my lenses clean. Um, and then later on, I'll do some some work on in Photoshop with some processing to make the sun uh, show up a little better. But I haven't been using any filters. Yeah. Uh, Susie Doe asks, do you generally use a tripod or just handhold your camera? Uh, often use a tripod more more often than not unless I'm chasing a bee or something that's moving qu too quickly um, most of what you saw today was from a tripod and the biggest reason for that for me because tripods can be a pain you you know you got to set them up and adjust them and all that sort of thing and it can take a while but for close-ups especially you've got such a narrow depth of field that having it stationary and then be able to make small adjustments without worrying about my hands moving and everything else uh is really helpful for me um so yes and i and, and actually with, with a tripod i haven't found very many tripods that are built for what i do because you can't find very many of them where you can get right down to the ground right yeah either because there's a center post or because the legs just don't spread very far so when I buy a tripod, I do two things right away. One is I cut the, the center post out with a hacksaw. And so there's no center post below the, the tripod head anymore. And then I take a grinder to the legs because there's a couple little bumps that keep the legs from spreading out. And if I take a grinder and I grind those little bumps down, then the legs spread out. And then I can get the tripod down to where I want. So I spend $250 on a tripod and then wreck it immediately just to make it work for me, uh, which is really frustrating. I wish somebody would make a tripod for macro photography, but I haven't found one yet. And I'm not cranky at all at all about that. <laughs> Another um, uh, equipment question from an anonymous attendee: What focal length do you tend to bring with you the most, or do you bring all your lenses? Um, I tend to bring all my lenses, but I've been really thoughtful about which lenses I own for that reason. So my my personal kit right now, I have a I have a fisheye lens um which is a lot of fun to play with and is very small and lightweight but most importantly i have a 11 to 20 to kind of lens which is a nice wide angle but a zoom so i have a little bit of flexibility so that's 11 to 20 and then i have a a nikon 18 to 300 which is an amazing lens because it's a wide angle at 18 millimeters and it's a wildlife lens at 300 millimeters but it's only about six inches long it's crazy and it's a really good lens and you know I think seven or eight hundred dollars maybe used, um, and then I have my macro lens. So that's really it. I have a I have a wide angle. I've got a, a zoom that's a wide angle to a telephoto, and then I've got my macro lens, and those I can usually manage to carry all at the same time. Um, I have one slightly bigger wildlife lens that I don't carry very often unless I know I'm going to go photograph birds or bison or something. Um, so that's 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 what I've got. Okay, so I win says, how much time do you spend on writing your blog and where do you find the time? Do you regard it as an important part of your job and so allocate time for it? I find it very hard to keep a personal blog, even though I think it's a very valuable tool for people to know about my research and passion. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, it is hard. I think, so to answer your first question, I spend probably an average of three or four hours a week on the blog. And that and that includes um, mostly the writing time, but also some of the photography and working up the photos to put in the posts and things like that. The coming up with the ideas is the is the big piece. And so that's why, you know, I, I post about twice a week on average. Um, and sometimes that becomes one and a half times a week on average if I'm a little bit behind, but I want to do it frequently enough that um you know people people know to expect something coming fairly soon and i do often feel like a preacher i say this a lot i feel like a preacher who's trying to figure out new ways to say the same thing each week right um 
But what helps is two things, really. One is being outside all the time. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have a job where I'm always out looking at things. And so I, I find new things and I discover them and often get a photograph of them. And then that gives me something to talk about, right? Um, because I'm I usually, I'm, I'm not just seeing them, but I'm learning about something new. And then I just share that immediately. And it's such a luxury to be able to learn something or photograph something and then immediately share it with a bunch of people and then get feedback. Because the feedback is also the best part of the blog is, you know, I've, I've written two books and books are terrible in terms of that because you write it and then you just sort of throw it out there and you never hear anything back. Where now I can say something immediately be corrected or be given in, extra information about it. And the the audience of the blog has been amazing in terms of its politeness, I would say. Um, almost no problems with people being rude or saying things that are, you know, not helpful. Uh, I think I blocked two people in the history of the blog, which is almost 12 years old now. Um, anyway, so that's some of the answers to your question. The other piece of it is, if I don't have anything to write about, I either get goofy, um, which I find to be easy uh, because that's just who I am, or or so, so I'll do like one of the quizzes that I do, which are completely just a farce and a spoof of, of quizzes. And it's I can just find six photos and think of something funny about them and make it into a quiz. Uh, that's really easy writing for me. Um, or I'll just go find a photo of a bobolink or a grasshopper, and I'll just do a quick little natural history thing on that species, which people appreciate and I probably should do more of, but it it tends to be a fallback for me. So that's a really long answer, but I love the question because it is something I spend a lot of time on. Oh, the other thing you asked was, is it part of my job? Yes. So I get paid to do it. Um, tracking hours is tricky because like if I'm out photographing for fun and I get a picture of a grasshopper and then that shows up on the blog, I'm not charging for the time that I'm photographing necessarily, but sometimes I'm at work and I see a grasshopper and I'll stop and take a picture of the grasshopper and I am charging for that time. So it all kinds of works out in the end, I guess. Yeah. And I win just uh, follows up by just saying how much she uh, has been following your blog for years and really appreciate the photographs and all the information that you share with your audiences. Well, that's really nice. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we're back to uh, another equipment question on the tripod. Chris Moreau asks, why not use a gor gorilla tripod with the flexible legs? It's meant to be wrapped around trees or posts, but I've found it useful for macro shots of plants. Yeah, I have one. Um, I got one for birthday several years ago because I asked for one because I wanted to try it out. I've used it a few times. The The issue I have with it normally is that it it's not as stable as I'm used to. And so the camera moves a little bit. And for close-ups, I have a lot of hard time with that, especially with the 105 millimeter macro, because it's just long enough that it, there's some counterbalance issues there. Um, but you're right. It does give you some flexibility. Um, I think it's for me, for me personally, it's the stability issue. I just, I, I haven't found it to be stable enough to, to get the sharpness that I want on most photos. Where I have found it really helpful is, um, you know, if I want to mount a camera someplace uh, on a tree or on a fence post or something like that, and then set it to take a few photos in a sequence and I walk away or I, you know, like if, if we've got during the bison roundups, I've done this before where I set it on a post and then have a series of photos based on that. It's really great for that, but I don't use it very much for macro stuff. Yeah. But I'm glad it works for you. Yeah. Just as a follow-up on, on my own, what I'm curious about is the wind. So, oh. so often when it's so windy, you know, your subject is moving around. You may be sitting still, but your subject is moving like crazy. And that's actually, ironically, that's where a tripod is helpful to me because when I'm not using a tripod, the wind is moving the subject and I'm moving because my hands are moving a little bit. And at least with the tripod, I can control one of those variables. And then I just have to wait for the wind to slow down for a second. Or I can even like with the tripod, I can move the tripod. Like I can tip it forward or back a little bit and try to track the movement pattern of whatever I'm photographing, but it's in a much more controlled way because it's on a tripod. Um, but yeah, wind is, I mean, for close-ups, especially, you know, the planes is a tough place uh to take close-up photos for that reason you just have to go out when the light and the wind are good you know and and it makes it less frustrating <laughs> yeah yeah well there's one uh, more question in the queue so far uh william pusateri asks what different types of programs do you present um 
so I have several kind of categories. I have, you know, the, one of the books I wrote was on my square meter project where I spent a year photographing everything I could photograph within a square meter of prairie here in, in Aurora at that little prairie I talked about. And so I, I do that one quite a bit um, because it's a topic that has really resonated with people, which I've been grateful for. So that's a fun one. But otherwise, there's there's sort of I have a I have, have talks where I talk about the little things in prairies, so plants and insects that sort of add up to to do most of the functioning that matters, and try to get people to think about all those small things and how they how they, how important they are and how overlooked they are, um, and that works so well with my macro photography, of course. Um, and then I do sort of a variation of that is insects and why insects matter. And talk about you know some of the really most the more fascinating insect stories that I know from my photos and learning about them, and then the other category is more on the like prairie management, prairie restoration, um, ecological resilience of prairies, how all that kind of works together, and and you know ideas and and things that people have learned about how to how to manage prairies for a diverse set of animals and plants. So those are the kinds of things I normally talk about. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and any uh, follow-up um, books to roadside wildflowers at full speed? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I get asked that a lot. So if you're not familiar with that, um, over the holidays a few years ago, I, I finally put into action an idea I had had in my head for a long time, which is, wouldn't it be funny if there was a wildflower guide for roadsides that was just a bunch of blurry photos, because that's what it looks like when you're driving by, right? And so I had actually mentioned the idea to people several times and said, hey, you should do a book like this because I don't really want to do it, but I think it's a funny idea. And nobody ever did it. So I finally said, fine, I'll just do it. And so I made a, a digital version of it uh, online and it's become a meme that pops up on social media every once in a while. And I was telling Laura before, it's, it's probably the thing that I'm most widely known for now, which is hilarious and sad at the same time because I've devoted 20, almost 26 years of my career toward prairie conservation. But what more people have seen than anything else is this stupid, you know, digital book of blurry wildflower photos. So, no, I I, it, I wish I could just come up with a funny idea that'll do the same thing as that, but I haven't yet. Yeah, well, it's a it's really a great commentary on the uh, um, the plant blindness that so many people experience, and so I think it does a great job of reminding people that you know you do have to slow down if you want to look at these things and you know i mean there are 30 different wildflowers featured in that little book and the information is all real i mean it's like oh yeah i have yeah. real information about the flowers it works yeah i try um, it. <laughs> just that the pictures are blurry and it's you know meant to be a joke but right, you can get right. something out of it i guess yeah. so uh another question was uh, uh can uh, is is it okay to ask if you've considered a book uh, of your winter photography? Uh, it's, it's definitely okay to ask. I have not thought about that, um, but I mean, I could. Uh, now that I've got this presentation <laughs> to put together, I have sort of some ideas, I guess, that I could turn into a book. Yeah. Thing with the thing with books is that, um, you know, I was talking about the blog earlier. I, books are really challenging. They they take a long time to work on. The writing part is in some ways the easiest part because it's the working with the publisher and the long wait between being done and then when a book come out and by the time it comes out you have better ideas than you had at the time and it's too late to change it and ah! and and again you don't get any feedback and so that's I'm I'm really fortunate to have the blog and I also I'm on Instagram which is like a mini blog in some ways but you know the idea that I can go out like I did this morning and get some photos and then immediately share them with the world and get feedback on them and and you know, learn something not only from the photograph and my own research, but then from people who see it and remind me or teach me about things. That's, for me, that's much more gratifying than a book. Um, but I've done a couple books and I'll probably do a couple more at some point. I just don't know yet what they'll be, but the Winter Prairie is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chris, we really, uh, we really, really appreciate your work and everything that you're doing for the Nature Conservancy and for prairies in the the plains of the Midwest, and uh, um, we just really appreciate this opportunity uh, to 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 see this work and to and for you to share it with us. Oh, thank uh, you. Just double check to make sure there aren't any other uh, questions here or comments. I do want to quickly share my screen again. Um, 
if I can. Uh, Laura, I'll just, if I can, I'll just say like, if, if people want to follow up with me about anything that you didn't get a chance for, I'm not hard to find. Um, send me an email and I'm, I'm happy to, to share ideas or talk back and forth about things. Uh -huh. We have another couple more questions or comments. Uh, uh, fascinating photography. We need snow in Illinois. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Now on to your blog. Uh, from Anonymous, Amy Sandine says, thanks so much, beautiful and informative. And Karen Burkhalter, would it be possible to add the plant names to the pictures? So uh, a few, yeah. <laughs> a few ideas there. Uh, I just want to uh, conclude by thanking the friends of the Tallgrass Prairie Center for making this program possible and um, to uh, urge you to come back and uh, see us next month for um, uh, another uh, webinar presentation. And it looks like um, I should also tell you that a recording of this presentation will be available on our YouTube channel soon. We'll send an email if you registered um, when the recording is available, if they're always closed captioned before they're put on the University of Northern Iowa website. So um, be patient and it will, uh, it will be forthcoming. So um, unless I've forgotten something big uh, with that, we thank you so much, Chris, and uh, um, appreciate your work. And thanks everyone for coming. Great, thanks everybody.